Okay. All right, everybody, welcome. Bukhim Abayim, B'zal Hashem, tonight, we're going to be learning Halichot Bat Yisrael, Chelek Yutet, and B'zal Hashem, tonight, we're going to be continuing the laws of Tzniut. Now, very important before we begin, we are sponsored tonight by an anonymous sponsor, and we are learning tonight for the complete and speedy refuah shlema of Shoshana Shachnaz Bat Monir and Monir Bat Chosni. So again, Shoshana Shachnaz Bat Monir and Monir Bat Chosni, we are learning for their total refuah shlema. May they have a speedy refuah shlema betoch shar cholei Israel. Uh, very quickly, we'd like to thank them for their sponsorship. And uh, may they have a speedy recovery betoch shar cholei Israel. Very quickly, amen. Chazakim Abruchim. So, as we continue in the laws of Tzniut, so we just want to make one important reminder to everyone that we mentioned already last week, but Be'ezad Hashem, it's important to remember it this week as well, to, re to remember the idea, which is that the reason, one of the main reasons for the laws of modesty and Tzniut is what it says in the, in, uh, the Torah, as we mentioned last week, we want the Shekhinah, we want the divine presence to dwell amongst us, in our homes, in our families, in our community. Because when the divine presence dwells in our homes, in our family, family in our community, so then what, what happens is we have blessing. That's really what it's all about. We want to have blessing, we want to have bracha in our lives. When Hashem is with us, we have bracha, we have parnasa, we have refuah shlema, we have health, we have everything. The Torah specifically says, There should be no matter of eroticism in your midst, because if there is, then v'shav me'acharecha, then at that point, the shechina will leave you. Which means that we would be actually causing ourselves a lot of damage, causing ourselves a lot of harm, had that been the case. Had that been the case, we would have ourselves a real situation on our hands. We don't want that. We want the Shekhinah to be with us. So therefore, in order to do that, we have to make sure that we watch over our Gidreit Tzniut, our uh, things that have to do with modesty. So last week, Baruch Hashem, we spoke about a lot of different areas of modesty. And tonight I want to go into another area that has to do with the laws of modesty. And it's a very important one. And this is the next statement that the rabbis say in the same Gemara over there in Masechet Brachot, and that is, Se'ar be'isha erva, which means that the hair of a woman is considered to be nakedness of a woman as well. So the question is, what exactly does that mean? What does it mean that the hair of a woman is considered to be the nakedness of a woman? What, what is that referring to? So in order to explain this, we'll go straight to the Shulchan Aruch. The Shulchan Aruch, of, cor of course, is the code of Jewish law. And the Shulchan Aruch says the following. This is an Evan Ha'ezer. One second, let's just admit whoever's joining us. This is an Evan Ha'ezer. Siman Chaf Alef Seif Bet. Says the following. Lo telechna benot Yisrael peruot rosh bashuk. The daughters of Israel should not go in the marketplace with their hair uncovered. Achat pnuya, whether she's Pnuya, which means that she's single, the achat eshet ish, or whether she's married. This is the halacha that is written in Shulchan Aruch. Now, the immediate question that pops up in this halacha is, wait a second. I said something quite peculiar. I said, actually, we have to make two points here. Number one, it says, Lo telechna benot Yisrael prot rosh bashuk. The daughters of Israel should not go with their hair uncovered Number one, Shulchan Aruch says, Bashuk, in the marketplace. Number two, Shulchan Aruch also says, whether she's single or whether she's married. So it sounds like it's saying that everybody's supposed to be wearing uh, some kind of a head covering. So how does this, how do we explain this? So in order to understand this, we're going to go now back to the source of the Gemara. And the Gemara is actually going to take us back to the source in the Torah itself to understand where is the actual source of the head covering. Where does, where, how do we know that a Jewish woman is supposed to cover her hair? And we'll understand this, Bezal Hashem, better. So the source of this, the Mepharshim explain, is the following. 
The Gemara in Masechet Ketubot Daf Ein Bet Amud Aleph tells us something very interesting. We know that whenever a husband and wife get married, so the rabbis instituted a rule that the husband must give his wife a ketubah, which means that this is a document where he is detailing that in the event of, God forbid, some kind of a divorce or death, then the estate of the husband will pay uh, X amount of dollars or shekels or whatever it is to this woman. And that's the original prenuptial agreement. It's uh, usually in the time of Chazal, it was paid over uh, with, with real estate so that the woman can actually have something with which she can make money, whether it was a field that would produce fruits or it was actual uh, properties that would uh, you know, have tenants in it. She, she would have an income. She wouldn't just be thrown out to the street. That's the idea of a ketubah. And the, the, uh, the woman could do something, God forbid, that would mess herself over so badly that she would forfeit the right to be paid her ketubah in the event of a divorce. There are certain things that are listed over there that are considered to be such a, um, such a violation of the marital agreement that she would actually have to forego getting paid her ketubah in the event of a divorce. So the Mishnah lists a whole lot of things over there. Obviously, one of the things would be if she, let's say, was unfaithful to her husband. That would, be, that would go without saying. But let's say other things. So the Mishnah says over there that one of the things is if she does not, if she, if she goes out, which means she goes out with her hair uncovered. So the Gemara tells us over there that if she would walk out with her hair uncovered, then she would actually forego her right to her ketubah because that's considered to be not behaving in the, in the accepted way of the Jewish women. So says the Gemara, we have a question on that. What do you mean it's not going in the accepted way of Jewish women? It's much more than that. It's a pasuk in the Torah. The Gemara tells us that it's actually a verse in the Torah itself, which describes that women's hair are supposed to be covered. So says the Gemara, where is that, where is that from? Says the Gemara like this, Tana devera bishmael, azhara, the Pasuk says like this, the, the Kohen shall untie the hair, uh, shall uncover the hair of the woman. Now, where is this found? This is found in a Pasuk that has to do with an Isha Sota, which means, Lo alenu, if let's say there was a woman who was uh, a married woman and she was behaving very flirtatiously with a particular man that was not her husband, she goes ahead and she, she behaves wrong, meaning she's not doing it, she's flirting with this guy. The husband is very upset. So he goes and he brings two witnesses and he tells his wife in front of two witnesses, do not be secluded with so-and-so. And the witnesses see this. And lo and behold, at a later point in time, uh, another two witnesses come and they say, listen, we didn't see anything, but we did see that she and the man that you had mentioned to her not to be secluded with, they were together in a locked room. We don't know if anything happened. We have no idea. But we do know that they were alone in a, in a lock, locked room. So says the, says the uh, halacha, in such a case, she has to be taken up to the Beit HaMikdash. He cannot be with her anymore until they clarify what's going on. So they clarify what's going on by taking her all the way up to the Beit HaMikdash. They have to give her a special drink, which is the drink for, um, for the sota, which means that he takes the, uh, the drink, which is the parchment of the sota. They write it in Hashem's name on it. They erase it. They put it into the water. They take the earth of the Bet HaMikdash, put it inside. They make her drink. And then the whole famous story happens. If she, uh, if she did the act, then she blows up lo alenu. And if she did not, she's blessed with children. Now, part of the procedure is to make her look bad. How do they make her look bad? By going ahead and uncovering her hair. So the Pasuk says, Upara et rosh haisha. He shall uncover the head, the hair of this woman. So says the Gemara, so what do you see from here? You see that the woman's hair, being that she's a married woman, she's supposed to be covered. Her hair is supposed to be covered. So the Pasuk in the Torah itself is already telling us that a married woman is supposed to have her hair covered. And that's why the Kohen, in order to particularly make her look bad, has to uncover her hair. Okay, so that's the idea that we find in the Torah.
So says the Gemara, from here we see, so we see specifically over here that a woman that's married cannot have her hair uncovered. So that's the source that we find in the Torah. That's the source that the Gemara uses to explain why it's forbidden for a woman to have her hair uncovered. And that's where the halakha comes from. Now we, we have to go back to what we said before. How come a single girl has to cover her hair? What is that? What's that all about? So the Mepharshim over there explained, it doesn't mean a regular single girl who's never been married. What that refers to is a single girl, meaning if God forbid she's a widow and now she's single, she was married and she lost her husband, or if God forbid or there was a divorce and, and now she's a divorced woman. So in such a case, she, uh, being that she was married, she still needs to cover her hair. And the idea behind that is, we're going to speak about it a couple of times later on tonight, B'zal Hashem, is that once she covers her hair, once she makes that something private, specifically for her husband, so then uh, that is something which can, cannot be revealed to the rest of the world. So being that that's the case, uh, it now takes on the status of an erva. And that's what the Shulchan Aruch was referring to. Okay, excellent. So now that we have the source for the halakha, there are many details about this halakha, and I would like to get to them. And I also would like to get to hopefully a deeper understanding of this halakha as well, which I think is just as important to understand also. So let's first of all talk about some, uh, some very important points. Number one, when the hair needs to be covered. So the halakha says that, that she needs to cover all her hair, meaning if let's say she wants to uh, take some of it out of her head covering. So really, that wouldn't be right. If she's covering her hair, then she needs to cover all of her hair. Now, like we said, the halacha over there in Shulchan Aruch specifically says, Lo telechna benot Yisrael perot rosh bashuk. Okay? So what that means is that they're not allowed to go and travel in the marketplace with, with um, perot rosh, which means they're not allowed to go in the marketplace with their hair uncovered, which seems to imply that if they're in the privacy of their own home, then there is no problem. And that indeed is the halakha, that if a woman is in the privacy of her own home and there are not foreign men inside of the house, she's there just, let's say, with her, with her husband uh, or with her own immediate family, the strict letter of the law would not have it, that she needs to go ahead and cover her hair because of the fact that this is something that is, um, that is not an obligation. The obligation is when she's out in the public. So that's important as well. Now, although that is the case, that mi'ikar hadin, from the strict letter of the law, a woman is allowed to be with her hair uncovered, uh, even in, in the privacy of her own home. The only real obligation is when she goes out so although that is true, I'd like to share with you a very interesting Gemara, which comes up in Masechet Yumadaf Mem Zayn. This is a very famous Gemara, but it's really important, and it's important to try and understand it. And once we understand it, B'ezal Hashem, I think we'll have an even greater understanding of the mitzvah of Kisui Arosh. So let's take a look inside. So says the Gemara, Masechet Yumadaf Mem Zayn Amud Aleph. Tanura Banan, our rabbis have taught, Shiva Banim Hayula Lekimchit. There were seven sons that uh, the woman named Kimchit gave birth to. The Kulam, each one of Kimchit's seven sons, Shimshu Bikeuna Gedola. Each one of them was able to operate, was able to serve in the temple, not only as a Kohen, but rather as a Kohen Gadol. So out of all seven of her sons, each one of them merited to be a Kohen Gadol. The very interesting Gemara, very amazing story. So Amrula Chachamim, the rabbi said to her, Ma asit What did you do that you merited such an amazing feat that you have uh, all seven of your sons have, uh, have become Kohanim Gdolim? Amra lahem, so she responded to them, Miyamai lo ra'u korot beti kile sari. So the Gemara says, the, 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 uh, the, the Brita says, that since the day she was married, the, the, uh, the 
the beams of her house never saw the braids of her hair. Now the rabbis heard that. Amrula, they said to her, Harbe asuken velo ho'ila. A lot of people have done so, and that hasn't worked, which is a very interesting one. So she's saying, you should know, the reason why I merited to have seven sons that all of them became Kuanim Gdolin is because even in the privacy of my own home, the beams of my household never saw the braids of my hair, which is an amazing thing. So the rabbis responded to her, you should know, a lot of people have done this, but it didn't yield the same result. The question is, what is going on over here? So first of all, what we can see is like this. Like we said, modesty brings blessing. When a person takes upon himself any kind of level of modesty, he brings more blessing on himself. As we see over here, this woman, Kimchit, took upon herself an added level of modesty. Again, not required by the letter of the law. The letter of the law is that in your own home, you're allowed to walk around freely. There's no issue. However, this woman took upon herself an added level of modesty, so she brought a, another level of blessing onto herself, and she therefore merited to have seven children that each and every one of them became Kohen Gadol. Now, by the way, the Gemara says how that happened. The way that it happened was that uh, her, her one son, who was the Kohen Gadol, actually became Tameh somehow. There was a Goy that by accident spit on him, and uh, they were through a conversation. They were talking, and this guy spit on him by mistake, and that made him impure, and therefore he had to go, uh, he had to, you know, uh, become pure for a seven-day period. So his younger brother stepped in and became Kohen Gadol for that seven-day period. Similar thing happened later on, uh, and then another brother had to go and, and, and instead of him for seven days. So this was going on, you know, it happened a few times, and it turns out, though, that each and every one of them ended up being a Kohen Gadol at some point in his life, which is still really an amazing, amazing thing. So this is something that we have to analyze. So what is it exactly about her tzniut that, uh, that, that caused her to merit to have seven sons that were Kohanim Gdolim? So says the halacha, the halacha is, uh, that, I'm sorry, says Rashi over here, there's a pasuk. The pasuk says, that kol kevuda bat melech pnima mi mishbetzot zahav levusha. The pasuk in Tehilim, it's in Perk Memhe, pasuk Yudbet, tells us that the honor of the daughter of the king is pnima, is inside. Meaning, when she demonstrates sniut, she demonstrates modesty, then she uh, is really doing uh, a tremendous thing. Not only that, but mi mishbetzot zahav, Levusha. She will now be, uh, she will now merit the Mishbetzot Zahab, which means the checkers of gold. Where do those checkers of gold appear? On the breastplate of the Kohen Gadot. So due, due to that fact that she was, she was living the life of Kol Kevuda Bat Melech Pnima, that she was living a life of Tzniut, so that gave her this chut to have the son that was Kohen Gadot, and all of her other sons ended up becoming Kohanim Gdolim as well. So that says Rashi, we find such a concept that Snut brings Kiunagadola. So that's number one, the explanation from Rashi. Now, I want to share with you two more incredible points, explanations about this Gemara. The first one comes from the Maharal in Netivot Olam. And he says like this, on a little bit of a deeper level. Says the Maharal, Netiv Hatsniut, chapter one, number seven. He says like this, Ki Hatsniut, because modesty, Bifrat, especially modesty. Mevi zera pnimi nistar kadosh. That modesty that this woman displays actually is the catalyst to draw from her husband a zera pnimi, a seed from her husband that is internal, hidden, and very holy. That will be a seed that will eventually become the one that will also be something that is very internal, very much deep inside 
of the Holy of Holies. Because we know the Kohen Gadol is the only one that is allowed to walk into the Holy of Holies once a year on Yom Kippur. So in the same way that she is demonstrating a tremendous sniut, that she's keeping herself very private, very much hidden from the rest of the world, so too she will draw forth from her husband's seed that will also merit to be someone that is going to be doing a job that is very hidden and very private. Where no one else has the right to go. So in other words, in the way that she is, is grabbing onto this idea of tzniyut and, and, and holding on to it so dearly, not allowing anyone else to see, not even her own walls to see her hair. So that, that mitzvah that she's doing grabs forth from her husband seed of, of, of some incredible person that also will merit to be just doing that kind of work in just such a modest way as well, meaning in the Holy of Holies where no one else can go except for him. That says the Maharal in the Tivot Olam. So that's the reason. In other words, it's sort of midah keneged midah. It's sort of measure for measure. The way that she conducted herself, Hashem gave her back that kind of reward as well. And this, Rabotai, last but certainly not least, is an explanation that I saw from the Ben Yehoyada, also known as the Ben Ishchai. And he gives one of the most incredible explanations that I want to share with all of you. Um, we'll get to questions a little bit later. If we haven't answered them, we'll get to them a little bit later. Okay. The Ben Ishchai says the following. And just like every good Jew, we answer a question with another question. In order to explain this Gemara, he goes ahead and he, he wants to address the creation of Chava, the creation of women from the beginning. This is based on understanding the creation of women from the beginning of time. We will find an answer to understanding why this Tzniyut really merited her to have these Kohanim Gdolim children. He says like this, there's a famous Gemara. The Gemara tells us that that when Hashem created Chava, Hashem built her from the rib of Adam. Now the word Vayiven, which means Hashem built her, the Gemara tells us in Masechet Shabbat, the Gemara tells us that the word Banaita in the Isles of the Ocean is how they say braiding, braided. So the Midrash tells us when Hashem says Vayiven, Hashem Elokim Tatsela, that Hashem built the, the tzela, built the rib that he took from Adam and built Chava, the Vayiven means that Hashem melamed shekila'a lechava. It means that Hashem, shekila kadosh baruchu lechava, that Hashem first braided the hair of Chava, and then the heviya, and then she brought, he brought her over to Adam. So the Gemara tells us that when Chava was created, not only was she created, but then Hashem braided her hair, and only subsequently, only after that point, did he then bring Chava over to Adam. So the Ben Ishchai asks a very interesting question. This is, I don't understand something. He says, I don't understand why Hashem couldn't have just built Chava out of this uh, rib. And then, you know, she would do her hair. She'd come over to uh, Chava, and at some point later, she would do her hair. What's the problem? Why did Hashem have to braid her hair first? And over here, he explains something a little bit more on the Kabbalistic level. And this is what he explains. The Ariya Kadosh teaches that the hair of a person actually represents dinin takifin, which means severe judgment, which is another way of saying um, no mercy. The, the hair of a person that comes out of his head actually represents the idea that Hashem has harsh judgment over people, over the world, over the community. That's what hair actually represents. And he explains that males are from the side of chesed. Males customarily cut their hair shorter. The reason explains the 
Ari, the Benishchai, quoting the Ari, is because they come from the side of Chesed. They come from the attribute of, of kindness. And the hair is severity, harshness. And for that reason, they can't handle it. They need to have the hair taken off. Whereas women, on the other hand, they come from the side of gvura, of strength. And for that reason, the harsh judgment which Hashem needs to have in this world is actually able to take, to take place in the hair of women. And they're able to be a source for it. They're able to be the root of it, which is something that Hashem created in nature. But Hashem didn't want it to be all powerful. Hashem didn't want it to have free reign, that there should be harsh judgment and severity running wild. Hashem didn't want that. So says the Ben Ishchai, based on the Ariya Kadosh, before Hashem gave Chava over to Adam, he braided her hair. What's the significance of braiding her hair? The significance of braiding her hair is that he contained the severity. He contained the harshness and the judgment that shouldn't run wild in the, in the world, but rather it should be somewhat subdued. That's what braiding the hair actually represents over here. And he wanted that judgment to be controlled. Okay. Being that that's the case, and by the way, it could be, now that we understood this, I just had a thought, it's possible that maybe there's a reason why we braid our chalot. Many people have a custom to braid their chalas. Perhaps the reason is because, as we know, the reason that uh, it's brought down to bake chalot on Friday is because of the fact that Chava destroyed the original chala of the world, which was Adam Rishon. How was he a chala? Because basically he was earth and he was water and he was molded and formed into a man, into the shape of a man. So he was like a dough. He was kneaded, basically. And she messed that up. And therefore, there's a custom that we bake chala on Friday, which was the day that she destroyed, so to say, or caused, brought about the death of man. And because of that, we, uh, women have a custom, so to say, to rectify that on every Friday they bake chalot. It's possible by braiding it. Now we have a little bit more of a deeper understanding, perhaps, that maybe that's why when you braid it, you're also subduing judgment. Just a thought. I don't know if it's correct. Just a thought that I had. Okay. Anyway. Being that that's the case. Now, says the Ben Ishchai, let's take it now a step further. When a woman covers her hair, what's going on? She's doing exactly the same idea. She is now taking the judgment that hair in general represents. And she's taking that severity. And she is not allowing it to spread outward. She's trapping it. She is subduing it. And at that very moment, she's allowing for the mercy of Hashem to permeate her life, her household, her community. She is, she's subduing the judgment. We pray for this all the time. We do so many things in order to make sure that this is what happens in our lives. For example, when you take the Netilati Daim cup in the morning, we said you first take it with your right hand and then you pass it to your left hand, and then you pour left over the right in order to make sure that the left is working for the right, the left is subdued to the right. We, try, we always try to make sure that the right hand is, is stronger because the right hand represents mercy. All, so many things we do with our right in order to make sure that we increase mercy because the right represents mercy. When a woman covers her hair, she is subduing the judgment on earth. She's She's nullifying and trapping the judgment, the harsh severity. It's a really incredible thing. And therefore, she's allowing the mercy of Hashem, the Rachamim, to permeate herself and her household and her family. And the dinim go forth. They go away from her. So now, that's what's happening when a woman covers her hair. Says the Ben Ishchai, beautiful. Look at the language of the Gemara. The Gemara says, Right, like we said, she had seven sons. So she responded to them, how did I have these seven sons? The answer is, They never saw the braids of my hair. Says the Ben Ishchai, look at this woman. This woman, Kimchit, was not only covering her hair, 
She was also, she also had her hair braided. In other words, she was, her intentions here were by far greater than just modesty. She understood that the modesty that she's doing when it comes to her hair is actually an intentional mechanism to subdue the evil, to subdue the judgment, to sub subdue the harshness. So not only did she cover her hair, but she had her hair in braids. So she had her hair braided to begin with, which was something that signifies subduing the harshness, subduing the judgment. And then on top of that, she covered. So in other words, her entire focus over here was to bring about Hashem's rachamim into the world and to eliminate the gvura, which is a really amazing thing. So that's what's taking place. That's what she was doing. And therefore, she merited to have these children. Now, the rabbis responded to her something very interesting. They said to her, you should know, a lot of people tried it, but it didn't work for them. So what does that mean? What are they saying? Well, you should know, a lot of people did it and uh, it doesn't work. No, the answer is like this. Says the Ben Ishchai, their point to her was that there's an added level of your Shemaim in how you're doing it. Because your intentions were not for the sake of getting seven sons that are Kohanim Gdolim. You had in mind a pure intention, which is you're trying to increase the mercy of Hashem in this world. That's your intention. That's what you're trying to do. Other people that are doing it are doing it because they're trying to get seven sons that are Kohanim Gdolim. They're trying to do it for ulterior motives. That's not the same thing. That's not the same level. So this woman was really doing something very pure, very, very holy. Her intentions were to, of course, first and foremost, to be modest. But she took her modesty to another level by understanding that her modesty is not just uh, an idea of, I don't want people to look at me to be attracted to me, which of course is like a very big deal, like we've been saying in the last couple of weeks, but it's beyond that. It's by me covering my hair, I'm actually doing something by far greater than what meets the eye. I'm actually getting rid of the severity and the harshness from the world, and I am bringing down a tremendous amount of mercy. I'm allowing the mercy of Hashem to come down on me and my family and my community. And, and therefore, uh, being that those were her intentions, that was the, that was the idea of, of why she merited to have seven sons that were Kohanim Gdolim. So that's the ex beautiful explanation of the Ben Ishchai, uh, the Maharal also, and of course, Rashi, that, uh, that they explain this Gemara very, very beautifully. This is again the Gemara in Yuma Dafnim, Zayn. Very important to be aware of this Gemara. Now, Being that that's the case, so the halakha says that when a woman who is supposed to have her hair covered uh, has her hair uncovered, so like we said before, so it's considered to be an erva, it's considered to be a part of the body which is not supposed to be revealed. And therefore, the strict letter of the law has it that if a man is in front of a uh, in front of a woman who is married uh, and her hair is uncovered, then he is not supposed to say any blessing in front of that woman, being that it's no different than any other part of her body which is supposed to be covered and it's uncovered. It would have the same status. That's a very important thing for us to understand on a practical level. Let's say that your husband uh, wants to say kiddush. And again, you're fully within your rights at home to not have any head covering on, no problem halakhically whatsoever. You're with your family, totally no problem. However, if your husband wants to say kiddush right now, then he cannot look at you while your hair is uncovered. Why? Because of the fact that So for that reason, although it is true that he doesn't have to, uh, that you don't have to cover your hair and he could technically turn around to the side and, and, and look a different direction, so it might make life a little bit easier if your hair is covered over there anyway. Now, a very important point, which I want to bring up over here. There's a very important heter from the Arucha Shulchan, and many poskim go with this. And it's a big leniency, but it's a useful leniency. And that is the following. The Arucha Shulchan explains something that we kind of mentioned before. And that is that 
this idea that the se'ar be'isha is erva, that the hair of a woman is like nakedness, is only as long as she goes ahead and generally covers it up. In other words, she has accepted upon herself to cover her hair. And now that her hair has been uncovered, it's considered to be naked. But so long as she has never started to conduct herself that way, so then we cannot go ahead and say that this is considered to be nakedness because she's no different than she's been her entire life. In the same way that you wouldn't say that a regular single girl who's never been married, that her hair is considered to be nakedness. So too, you will not say that about the lady that is married who simply has never covered her hair because she never took that step to make it a private part of her body. That is the heter of the Arucha Shulchan. Many authorities um, use this leniency when, it, when necessary. Like for example, like I said uh, last week, we talked talk, talking about, uh, uh, let's say at a wedding, you have to get up there and make Sheva Brachot and there's a woman there that's married and her hair is uncovered. So again, it's the same idea. She has never covered her hair to begin with. And therefore, there's no problem of saying a blessing, at least according to this opinion of the Arucha Shulchan. So that's a very important thing to be aware of, that it's not considered erva, at least in his opinion, uh, until the point where she makes the step of, 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 uh, of going and covering it. Um, now, women don't have this problem to begin with. A woman is allowed to make a blessing in front of another woman whose hair is uncovered, even if she always does cover it. Um, on the other hand, the, the question is in terms of their husbands. Now, one thing that I do want to share with you is that in performing this mitzvah, the Alkut Yosef does say something very important. And that is that um, there's a certain leniency with how much of the hair is allowed to be seen. And I'd like to read to you his language inside. One second. Basically what he says, I can't find it right now, but what he says is that when a woman does cover her hair, uh, if she has part of her hair revealed, so in other words, let's say she has one of these snoods or a tichel, uh, any one of the, or a hat, let's say, and one finger breadth of her hair is uncovered. He says, even if it's two finger breadths of her hair that are uncovered, so then technically it's still uh, considered to be covered, um, and that is the minhag, that he says is the minhag of the uh, Sephardic women. So therefore, if let's say a woman is wearing something and it slips off a little bit, and it's you see one or two uh, uh, finger breaths worth of hair, so then technically he says that that is considered still to be covering your hair. Now obviously, you know, if it keeps on slipping, eventually it's going to fall off, so you're, you're going to want to fix that. But uh, it's just important to be aware that that is a, indeed a rule. Okay. Now, the big question that we have to address is the following. The big question when it comes to the mitzvah of covering your hair is the mitzvah of shetels slash wigs slash pea nochrit. This is a big question. This is a question again, of whether or not when a person decides to wear, to cover their hair with a wig, with hair, let's, let's keep it simple, from a non-Jewish woman or any other woman besides her own hair, let's, let's talk about that, which is the most common thing, where you take hair from some other person, they attach it to something, and they make a wig out of it. So is that halakhically acceptable to wear as a head covering or not? This is a huge machlok et aposkim uh, as to whether or not it's an acceptable head covering. Now let's line up both teams over here. You have gdole olam on both sides of the coin. So the first, the first and foremost, I think, and I shouldn't say first and foremost, but in America, the, the, the rabbi that allowed wearing wigs um, and seemingly everybody agreed with him, at least in America, was Rav Moshe Feinstein. He was the one that basically said that wearing a wig is halakhically acceptable. I know that Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky also uh, agreed from what I know. Uh, a lot of the American post scheme went with that. 
based on Rav Moshe's psak, a lot of women wore, uh, wear shaitals in America based on the minag set forth by Rav Moshe, Alav Shalom. In Eretz Yisrael as well, you had the Chazon Ish, his wife wore a wig. You had Rav Shach, Alav Shalom, his wife wore a wig. You had the uh, Briskarov, great, one of the greatest tzaddikim, his wife wore a wig. The, the Ger Rebbe, his wife wore a wig. The Belzer Rebbe, his wife wore a wig. Amongst the Sephardic post scheme, you have Chacham Ben Sion, Abba Shaul, Alav Shalom, Zecher Zedimu Kabash Tavacha, that was the, the Rosh Hashiva of Porat Yosef, who writes clearly in Chelek Aleph of Ole Tzion, that it's allowed to, you're allowed, a woman is allowed to wear a wig. I believe his own wife wore a wig. So this is something that you have on the side of those that are pro wearing wigs as a proper head covering, a very beautiful long list of rabbis that permit wearing wigs. Uh, whether it's, uh, we have Sephardic, we have Ashkenazic, we have uh, great Chachmei Israel, Tzadikim, incredible people that say that it's permissible. On the other hand, you also have tremendous, tremendous Gedolei Israel saying that it's forbidden, that it's not a valid head covering. And first, I mean, famously, you have Maran Arishon Metzion Alav HaShalom, Zecher Tzadik Vacha, Rabu Vadi Yosef, Tzchutoy Agen Aleinu, who was screaming so much against the idea of wearing wigs. He was so against it, and he felt that this is not a proper head covering. He felt it is against the halacha, and therefore he, he was very sharp against it and criticized greatly. Together with him was Zecher Tzadikvacha Harav Vosner, who was, again, a tremendous gaon, tremendous posek in our generation, and he also was screaming a whole lot about the wigs, and he felt that it's not a proper head covering, and he felt that when it, when it looks so good like it looks today, he said it's basically uh, even better than hair. And therefore, he said it is 100% forbidden, it's asur. And therefore, again, like I'm saying, there are two sides to the coin. And uh, you have tremendous poskim on both sides. Huge, huge, huge people. I mean, malachim, all of them, angels. Really, really, I mean, incredible, incredible malachim, angels. And therefore, uh, I would never dare to put in my two cents about who's right and who's wrong, because who am I? Uh, not even close. Uh, however, however, what I can tell you is that every person should have a rav that they go ahead and they will consult with their rav and their rav will tell them what his view is regarding going ahead and wearing a wig if it's something which they view as acceptable, if it's something which they view as unacceptable. And that's how you have to do it. Make a row for yourself. And that's how you eliminate all doubts. That's the idea. So in, with respect to the wig, and by the way, in the camp of those who permit wigs, so once again, you have a question. Are there some wigs that are considered to be immodest? Are all wigs considered to be just fine? Uh, how do you view it? Again, you, you would need to have a rabbi who would guide you on this area, uh, in, this, in this matter, and would just explain to you what is okay, what is not okay. And that's how you'll, that's how you'll figure out what to do. Uh, it's, it, there are too many different opinions out there about what is okay and what's not okay. And therefore, I'm just trying to present the general picture. Uh, there's no question that in America, the custom is to rely uh, on wigs, that's what we see uh, commonly done. That's what is normally uh, done in different, in the circles here in the US. In Israel, I think it's much more prevalent not to rely on wigs, even though many people do. Um, and again, I'm just trying to paint a picture and every person is supposed to go ahead and to ask their Rav, what should they do? And once their Rav tells them that it's okay or that it's not okay, then they have their answer but uh, they shouldn't really make any decision like this unless they go uh, and talk to their rabbi about it first. Okay, very good. If we have any questions, then we can go ahead and take them now. If not, we'll just keep going. Okay, all right, fine, very good. Another couple of, we have a, we have a question here, sorry. Oh, a few questions. Um, 
Okay. We mentioned that a divorcee and a widow have to continue covering their hair. But then how will people know they are divorced or widowed so that they can remarry? Is this where the one tefach being able to show comes into play? Um, okay, I don't know. I don't know about the one tefach being able to show. I never heard about one tefach being able to show. I mean, that's a lot. That one tefach is like a whole, it's like three inches. I don't know. I don't know if that's something. I'm not familiar with that. But um, there are there are perhaps um, there are perhaps certain uh, leniencies, maybe that some that her rav might find for her. Uh, but the general idea is that she's still supposed to cover her hair. Um, I do believe that Rav Ovadia, alava shalom who is the, the, the one who very much, very harshly criticizes uh, going ahead and wearing a wig, Ovadia is lenient, I believe, that a divorced woman or a widow is allowed to wear a wig. Uh, so he does, he does find leniency for wigs with respect to those people. Um, but beyond that, you'd have to consult with your rabbi. and Hopefully, uh, they would be able to figure something out that works for everyone. Okay, we had another question. Um, let's take that question. Okay, for wigs, shouldn't there be restrictions of how long it should be? Again, that's a great question. Shouldn't there be a restriction on how long the wig should be? Fantastic. There might be, there might not be. So, you know, this is a question for your rub. If you have a question like that, and you think that perhaps there's an issue, you would have to go ahead and address that uh, with your of, and then that's how you'd answer that question, 100%. Okay, uh, so how do we know what the correct answer is in Shemaim regarding wig verse tichel? Do we go unpunished if we just follow our rabbi's advice? Yes, if you follow your rabbi's advice, and your rabbi has uh, confidence in what he's saying, that, that it is indeed permissible, and he has the power to explain why it's permissible. He'll bring you a proof from here and he'll bring you a proof from there. And he can explain to you that, no, I, I disagree with whoever says that it's a problem. It's fine. It's no issue. Look, so-and-so and so-and-so and all these great rabbis before me have done it. And, uh, and it, it, if, if, if somebody is able to explain uh, and he's a, a competent rub and he's paskining that this is permissible, so then that you can rely on your rub, just like uh, everyone relies on their rabbi. Be'ezad Hashem, soon we will have the Sanhedrin and uh, Mashiach will come and then there will be one accepted psak in all of Kalal Yisrael and we won't have to say your rabbi and his rabbi and all that. Everyone will have the same group of rabbis, the Sanhedrin. And there will be one yes or no for all of us. But until then, yeah, you have to have your rav and you answer, you, he answers your question and that's how you do things. Okay, great. Now, a couple of more points before we have to end. So, a couple of more points in the realm of tzniut in general. So, certain things come up sometimes. For example, a woman wants to, let's say, get a haircut, uh, and the only barber available is a male. The Alkut Yosef says that you shouldn't get a haircut by a male barber. Uh, oftentimes, enough for that male barber, this will be, interaction would lead to, uh, you know, some kind of hearing thoughts about the person that he's giving the haircut to because of the fact that he's getting up close and you know dealing with this person physically and therefore even though it's strictly business but on the other hand it's also not the right thing to do uh, and the same thing vice versa a man shouldn't get a haircut by a woman uh, that's considered to be a breach in sniut also when it comes to choosing a doctor the poskim say that it's better ideally if you can have a female doctor that would be much better. Uh, that way there's no issue of yichud, uh, being alone with him. Uh, that way there's no issue of, of, of touching because she's a, she's a doctor that can touch you and there's no issue. Now, on the other hand, if let's say that you feel that the doctor that's a woman is just not as good as the doctor who's a man, He's, he's, he's just uh, much more competent than her. He understands you better. He understands... Uh, the situation better, you've seen him in action, he's prescribed 
medications that worked. He, you, you, you feel like he's better. In such a case, so then it's okay to go ahead and use him. Uh, that's uh, provided that he doesn't, he's not known to be someone with very loose morals. He keeps everything strictly professional. Uh, you have to be aware of Yichud, of course. Don't lock the door to the office. That would be something that would present a problem of Yichud. And, uh, and remember that not everything that a doctor gives you some, uh, is, is always okay. Sometimes it's a, uh, it could be the medicine is a uh, treif. Let's say that it's a cough syrup with a treif type of a flavor there. And it's a good, sweet tasting flavor. You might not, you shouldn't take it, for example. Or if let's say it's a birth control, that's something which, uh, which is problematic. So this is something which you have to, uh, you know, again, you have to ask your rub and ask the Shiloh about whether it's okay or not. Uh, if it's an OBGYN, so they say that you really should avoid male OBGYNs, but uh, if it's absolutely necessary, but at the end of the day, if it's really, really necessary, then it's okay because again, it's, it's a medical thing and therefore uh, we assume that it's going to be just fine as long as, yeah, of course, it's, it's supposed to be strictly professional and he's, he's doing his job and that's it. But again, ideally, uh, it would be something that we would try to avoid. But if it's not, if it's absolutely necessary and you can't avoid it, then that's something else. Okay, everybody, I think we can call it a night for tonight. If we have any questions, we'll take them now. If not, then uh, we can stop over here. Pleasure learning this with you. Okay. Thank you. My pleasure, everybody. Have a wonderful evening.